the thing that um, I had realized is that um, as our company grew, we weren't getting the sales that we needed. Um, and therefore, everyone was uh, becoming more and more fragmented. People were being let go, people were leaving. And so it really, it, it took a lot, of, a lot of wind out of my sails. So I was driving home one day, and um, one of my other designers that I had hired there was like, hey, you should listen to this podcast, like super nonchalant, like, eh, it's okay, you know, you should listen to it. And I was like, okay, fine, sure. Um, and uh, this podcast, it, the, what I encountered completely changed everything about my, like, the way I approach branding, and obviously design, and my life. Um, and what this podcast talked about was, um, this, the, 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 the podcast was hosted by this guy named Jesse Bryan. And Jesse Bryan asks this really interesting question. He asks, what is the biggest brand in the world? What is one of the most, what is one of the biggest brands in the world, the most powerful? And I see someone over here that's liking this already. Um, so the, the, so I, I started thinking about that. So I, I would encourage you, think about this. Just think about it for yourself right now. Do a little exercise. Thing. What do you think, maybe two, for the sake of time, biggest brands in the world are? Just think about it. Give you 10 seconds. Maybe not 10 seconds. Um, it, you probably said something along these lines, right? It's one of these. Um, and I would have probably said the same thing too at one point, right? Um, the thing that was interesting that Jesse Bryan had brought up, uh, or, or what he said, was completely counterintuitive to, to, to me at the time. He, he said the biggest brand in the world is the United States. And the reason why it's the biggest brand in the world is because it was kicked off the right way. It started with beliefs. And so what did they do? What did the founding fathers do? They wrote down uh, the Declaration of Independence, right? So think about how that document starts. All men are created equal, right? So that's a core unwavering belief. And then what, well, there's no flexibility in that, right? So what, what follows from that? That they have certain rights, right? And so on and so on. So did they focus on the product? Like Jesse asked this question, did they focus on the product? Did they focus on how much land they had? You imagine the Declaration of Independence was like, hey look at we have like all this land and it's really cool and it's really cool over here. And it's like, no, 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 because it would be an incredibly thin, it would be an incredibly thin place to start with. So I thought, yeah, I mean, that's where, it, that is how you start a brand, right? <clears throat> so the, the thing that's interesting is that we can do this with ourselves. So everything starts with beliefs. Beliefs might be a kind of an amorphous word, so you can think about them as convictions. You can think about them as, you know, why. <clears throat> so, um, Another way of thinking about it is your story as well. And um, that can also be a very convoluted word. So when people think of the story, it's, it's kind of like a buzzword. I think someone already had said this here, or maybe it was something I was listening to, but they, they basically brought up this exact point. So by the end of this talk, I hope to give you some actionable steps for understanding what your story is and to make it concrete with words and actions. The words are gonna be, gonna be a really important thing throughout this. So I call this concept story living and not storytelling because storytelling is like your dad telling you a story at night or something. That's what comes to my mind. You're not going to sit someone down and tell them, hey, let me tell you a story. Why don't you come sit on my knee? You know, something like that. Um, that would be really creepy. <laughs> um, so let's think, let's think about this. Um, let's think about this. Uh, Apple, think different, right? Everybody knows this. Everybody uses Apple as an example for everything. Because um, they're awesome. Hey, why not? Why not just follow the pack? I'm the sheep. Um, so, uh, what is, does think different, think about this, does think different have anything to do with software? No, it has nothing to do with software. It has nothing to do with the product or service, it has nothing to do with what you offer. So it's a mantra, right? And the mantra has nothing to do with what you offer. I, this is something I really strongly believe in, that your why should have nothing to do with what you offer. Um, I have some notes here just from different people, and that exactly what Corey had said. What do you say? What do you say? Affirm the good. Affirm the good. That has nothing to do with filmmaking, right? So, um, an interesting example I wrote down here is that. Uh, oh wait, sorry. Just totally skip that. Out. Um, oh yes. Okay. So your mantra. Your mantra is it, it is something that has nothing to do with your product, like I had said. 
Um, they're considered, the, the mantra, rather than just being a bar, marketing buzzword, is a sacred formula and is, deep, and is a deeply personal ritual, right? So that word actually has a lot of staying power if you use it in its proper context. <clears throat> a, an interesting mantra, someone we had just talked about, Matt had talked about, is Unipar Sarah, right? Unipro Sarah. I should be able to say that, I live in this town. Um, so, in turn up. So, what did he say? Always forward, never back. He didn't say, we build great churches, right? Because that wasn't his why. That wasn't why he did what he did. He, his core unwavering belief was that always forward, never back. And that inspired and brought people along on his mission, right? <clears throat> like I had said, it has nothing to do with your product. Your why has nothing to do with your product. So here's three points about why your why is important. It energizes you when you burn out. Everyone burns out. If you don't think that you burn out, I think you're lying to yourself. Everyone burns out because of so many different factors in their life. The more, one of the more interesting things is it allows for you to innovate into other ideas. So we build great churches does not allow you to innovate into other ideas. The reason why Apple succeeded and Dell failed is because they, they told you how great the computer was. Look at this product stack, look how fast it is. That's great, that's all, that's all well and good, but it got no one believing and buying into why you do what you do. Lastly, and there's actually a million points about this, but I've just tried to distill it down into three. It's rooted in emotion and story, not features and logic. Um, and the, and that last concept is why I'm a convert, right? No one, someone didn't argue me into the church. Now, I might be an exception. My dad's a philosopher. I really like, like, analytic philosophy and things like that. But really, it was one person's story living, a couple story living, that helped me to come to the church. And, they, and, and it was their why. It was why they were doing what they were doing. So Simon Sinek... By the way, none of this is original. None of what I'm saying is original. Please do not give me credit. Um, Simon Sinek has a great book. I'm, ju I'm just, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants and I'm trying to actually put these things into practice and make them actionable. Um, I think where Simon Sinek probably doesn't take us completely is how to do these things and I'm trying to do that here. So the golden circle is why, how, what. I'm focusing on the why because a lot of us know the how and the what and what we do. We know how we do it. And we, we know like, all the little minute details. We know what we do. And we can explain what we do really well. But when it comes to telling someone why, we, I think a lot of us really struggle with it. As Simon Sinek says, people don't, don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. Most companies know what they do and how they do it. And they individually know why they do what they do. But they have never written it down and collected all the beliefs into a single cohesive manifesto. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. These guys actually wrote down their manifesto, you can find it online, which I felt, find it super refreshing. It was great to read. It made me really pumped to be there. So, another exercise. I want you to pick out two companies, people, or things that you really love. Think about them. Companies, people, things. I'm gonna name my three. I really love Dropbox, it's a really cool company. I love so many things about it, their culture, the illustrations. I really love Iceland. I don't love it because there's like, I, I don't love it because when I go there, there's like certain things there. I love the idea of it as well. I can be away from it and still really blend it. And I really love mid-century homes. Um, I, I wish I lived in them. Um, and there's so many different reasons for why I love these things. But I don't love them because they have certain features or properties. I love them because they make me feel and they tell a certain story. <clears throat> so why write? Why do I say write down your story? Something interesting happens when we write something down. We become objective about our story. We can revise and we can revisit our beliefs. And a year from now, you can revisit it and see if you really lived up to it. This gets the ball rolling. Writing these things down gets the ball rolling. Because in the future, you will find that you have much better words than you do now. You'll evolve. 
We move from feelings to words. If we don't have the words, all you have is a feeling. And this is the power of the written word. You have scripture, you have the catechism, right? They're written down so that people can access them and they can be revised, not the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> So why, 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 why? We gain clarity and differentiation. If there's one thing I want you guys to take away from this, is that your why differentiates you from every other person. If you have a company, it differentiates you from those same companies in that same space. So, no one can steal your story. And it gives you clarity about who you are. It re-energizes you and sustains you when it gets tough, like it said. And another really super important component about this writing concept is that it will give you real marketing copy. So bear with me here, I'm gonna give you a few points about why this is super important. When you find yourself struggling to write that next advertising, pamphlet, or social media marketing piece, or tweet, you will have at your disposal a virtual bank of ideas if you start with why. That don't, boil down, that don't boil down to listing out your features, how many things you have, or buy, buy, buy. You don't hear in a Mercedes-Benz commercial someone yelling, come on down, I'm a Mercedes-Benz, you buy You know? It's, <laughs> they start with this very particular belief, and everything flows from that. So writing it down helps you to actually utilize your beliefs and make a real marketing happen. Oh, skip the slide. Well, I'll just say it. Virginia Woolf. I have no idea who she is. Great quote, though. <laughs> if you do not tell the truth about yourself, you cannot tell it about other people. I'll say it one more time. If you do not tell the truth about yourself, you cannot tell it about other people. So, how can you talk about Christ, his saints, his church, if you don't know the truth about yourself? If you don't know what you believe, not like some relativistic, you know, individualism, this is what I believe, but your story. If you don't know what you believe and how you got there, how you arrived at your beliefs, then you can't tell the truth about the church. So are you skeptical of this? So is Kevin O'Leary, Shark Tank. <laughs> Mr. Wonderful. I don't know why he has that name. It's so, so unwonderful. So this is what he says. I don't care about the purpose behind your product. All I care about is whether or not, I can't even do his accent, whether or not it is going to make any money, right? And I remember seeing this on the front of the magazine, right? He said, I, you know, if I have, I would fire my grandma to make money. I was like, whew. Um, <laughs> and what's interesting is someone pointed this out to me when I was coming up with this whole, this whole system of why. I'll get back to why it is, why I have to create it, more or less a system out of this. And they said, oh, well, look at that. Yeah, it doesn't matter, right? Why does it matter if you're not getting customers? So if you're not getting customers, sign-ups, sales, making money, seeing real change in people, falling in love with the church, people falling in love with the church, then your why doesn't seem to matter, right? However, you notice something really interesting here. Mr. Wonderful, as they call him, is himself starting with why. This is his why. All that matters is to make money, right? That's a belief. So, he feels very strongly about it, he believes that, and that's his brand, <coughs> that's his story. But if we realize our beliefs are not affecting anyone, then we have to ask ourselves something like this. Am I willing to risk something for my beliefs? The same way that the martyrs of the church risk their lives to believe something, are we risking something much less for what we believe? And this is something that I struggle with a lot because I feel very, uh, very privileged and very, um, very safe. I feel like I'm very, I, 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 I insulate myself from hardship. And so I'm, I'm working on taking those risks with what I want. <clears throat> so how can we put this into practice? Well, I, the way I see it, there's at least two things, two components. You have your personal brand development, what people call your story. Right? And if you run a business, an organization, you're part of one, or you, um, you're, you're kind of trying to start something up, um, there will be organizational brand development. So, 
Some more practical things. This probably sounds really stupid, but dress as a theme, right? We all do this, but I think if we're intentional about it, we can really start to develop a personal brand. So I personally wear the same exact thing every day. Um, you'll see me throughout the conference. I'll be wearing this. these shoes. I have five socks, three pants, five shirts. I don't know why I'm doing this. <laughs> and um, yeah, I wear the same thing every day. And people notice that. And they're like, oh yeah, that's what's the brand. That's who he is. And there's all sorts of reasons why. So when people ask me, I can explain it. It helps to get a conversation started. And it just, it, it, it creates this persona around you. That's from the minimalism documentary. This is a really interesting one that I borrowed from a guy named Productivityist, if you can say that. And it's theming your life based on virtues. And I'll get back to what this looks like, or the next slides will explain this, which is essentially related to story living. So story living. Story living is this idea that our intentions need constant attention. Right? So we all have great intentions, but if we don't give them attention, then we can really fail to live up to these virtues. Right? So the three intentions that I've been working on, and I do kind of poorly, are compassion. So really trying to listen to people, be empathetic, go out of my way to be compassionate towards others, to be incisive. This is something that comes more naturally to me, to be, more, to be analytical, to kind of call people out on their bowl and be like, that's not true, that's not true. And then thirdly is to be patient with my kids. I have four kids, and my patience is stretched. Um, so the thing that's interesting about this concept of theming is that you can do this throughout the day, the week, the month, the year. And so productivityist, can't remember his name, that's not, his, that's not the name that his parents gave him, um, but his company is called Productivityist, and he, he talks about theming your, your year based on these different these different concepts, right? And the themes, these are things that speak to me, right? And so you can find what these things are, these things that are difficult for you and the things that come more naturally to you and to utilize them throughout your everyday, your everyday life. The concept of the story bank is also really cool when it comes to story living. This is actually more of the real practical storytelling and it helps to really engage with people. In terms of evangelization, I think it's one of the most effective tools and Ramit Sethi talks about this, a concept of story banking. Talks about this concept of story banking. And the, basically the idea is have five really great stories from your life and try to practice them with people. And try to find stories that relate to different aspects of your life. So if someone's talking about something that was hard, you find a story about something that was hard in your life or something about that, that was funny, you try to find the funniest story, the funniest things happened to you, or you try to, uh, something about um, experiencing loss, right? Then you talk about that. And so you can create this story bank that really helps people to relate to you. So in terms of, in terms of organizational brand development, um, this one's a little more uh, um, concrete. It's, it's, a lot, it's something I'm more familiar with. And uh, there's three points here. Write your Bible. Right? <clears throat> this is your manifesto. Your manifesto. These guys wrote theirs. Now go do yours. Right? You can go read it. You can see what it looks like. Have a great design system in place. So have your your belief language that you believe match your visual language. So a system. It has to be systematic. It just can't be willy nilly. The beautiful thing about a design system is that it's not arbitrary. It's not, oh, well, why don't we try this out, right? It's rooted in belief and it becomes systematic. You can be intentional with your brand because you know why. Your manifesto language should be extrapolated into your visual language. The last thing is this concept I've come up with called your brand health scorecard. Uh, I borrowed this idea from a friend at Airbnb who's um, a lead designer. And the idea is that you should be constantly checking in on where your brand is at. So, the way that I've broken it down here is utilizing the 5W1H method, but I've switched it around. <laughs> we start with why, and we move on from there. So, it's borrowing the who, what, where, when, why, 
how concept, and I'm melding it with Simon Sinek's concept of the belief circle, uh, sorry, the golden circle, and then I'm kind of spitting it back out and coming up with what I feel like has worked for me. So why? Firstly, what is your belief buy-in? So do people actually buy into what you've said? Um, do, do people actually buy into your beliefs? So do the people in your organization, the players that you're working with, those people you see every day, do they really believe what you believe? They're how? Your endorsed method. So are people kind of just going off and being like, yeah, I, I tried this out and it worked, or you, you go and you find that person doing that thing in, in church or something and saying, yeah, I was just handing these out and I thought it would be a good idea. It's like, no, 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 no. We have endorsed ways of doing things. We vet how we do it. <clears throat> and please come talk to me after about these in more practical terms. I think I can unpack them. Experience help. So are people in my organ are people that experience my brand, <clears throat> are we getting feedback from them? Right? And am I reaching out to them to make sure, hey, how was how was it? What did you think about that? The who? Is my brand accessible? Am I marginalizing people? This can be really talked about in so many different terms of the who, but that's one. Is my brand accessible to lots of different people? Am I tailoring my brand specifically for one group and is that okay? Should I be more broad? When? And is my brand um, able to, um, I don't have my notes here for that one, I'll skip it. Um, <laughs> where? The adaptive brand. This one's a little, this one's a little, I know this one. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so adaptive brand. Uh, is my, does my brand change when, when, based on those themes, right? Can I, can I utilize my brand as an overarching or undergirding concept and, and evolve it based on themes, seasons, different events, right? So is my brand adaptive in that sense? And so a tool that I've developed to, to really bring it into practical terms are, is this concept called design cards. I do not own the domain name, do not go to it yet. Um, but it's available, so I'll get it. Um, so uh, in this whole concept, I've created an entire system that individuals and companies can utilize. I'm taking pre-sales here, so if I can get a few people to buy it, I'll buy the domain, I'll go print these, I'll ship them to you, come talk to me, we'll do business. <laughs> so, this is how it works. Why, how, what, who, when, where. So, if you start with why, everything else will make sense. And it's literal cards, these are actual cards. And the reason why I've actually chosen cards and not made us into a web application is because I believe interacting in this way is one group effort, you can, you can ask someone to ask you these questions. You can, you can move through them yourself. But having something tangible in your hands, there's just something very different about it. They say reading a book, you're able to retain the knowledge better than an you know, iPad, things like that. <clears throat> oh, that's right. I want to do a little exercise. So uh, I'll pick one <laughs> for a person here. Um, can I ask you a question? Yeah. All right. So um, let me show you how this system could potentially work, right? Um, so I want you to think about what's something that you find draining that's like really difficult for you to do in your, in your work or as part of your mission in life. Time to get vulnerable here. Before, we'll actually, we'll ask you to just come up, come up here and grab this. Sure. sure. That I'm going to get this on Do you want me to do like personal, like work life or home life? Yeah, yeah, either one. Okay. Um, draining can be, I have five kids. Um, under the age of three and a half. So, uh, <laughs> I have two sets of twins. Um, so, the draining part is my kids can, uh, they have their own will, the, the older ones, and they just can't them to draining. Alright, that's it? That's it. Okay, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, uh, what I, what would, what, what the cards would potentially help you to do is to really unpack that concept of dream, right? And then you could ask, okay, why is that hard? Now that's a little more practical of a thing, right? But you, we could really start to get down to brass tacks about why that's hard for him. And organizationally, that could help us to mitigate any sort of pain points that we would have. So would we ask him to do that every day? 
Oh, there's no, no, we wouldn't. Well, why? Why wouldn't we? Well, because it's hard for him. Well, why hard? Because of this, right? And if you're talking about your personal brand, this can really help you to develop and avoid things, not in the bad sense, but avoid things that, for instance, I'm not good at writing. I am not good at writing. And that's something that I, it took a long time for me to realize about myself. It's, it's, it was, it was, I, I believed something about writing and it was false. So the design cards are a, a tool or a system that can help you to do that. Here's uh, something that you can look at and, and um, it, it's, it's really this in action. I did this for an agency and I, this really is the extrapolation and the distillation of all of their beliefs and about five things. And you'll notice that none of these have anything to do with agency. They have nothing to do with the design that they did, right? And, you know, if you want to look, briefly look over those. But that's a practical application of how your beliefs can inform your company. And these guys have actually hit a lot of hard, hard, hard points in their agency life. They weren't getting clients, they were new to kind of the whole thing, but these are the things that helped to sustain them. And on their website, these were the things that informed all of their marketing. And in advertising, these were all the things that informed what they wanted to say to their clients. So you really start to see the power of why. Going back to the United States as a concept, as Jesse Bryant said, the biggest brand in the world is the United States, but Jesse Bryant's wrong, right? The biggest Amen. brand in the world is the church. Amen. <laughs> so the Catholic Church is the biggest brand in history. 2,000 years of core, unwavering beliefs. People willing to risk everything for Christ. The farthest reaching brand with the most people on brand. <laughs> right? <laughs> Therefore, what I want you to do is... What was that? Get on brand, man. That's, That's right. so awesome. <laughs> so... What I want you to do is, what I, what I hope you can do for my talk is find how your personal brand, your company brand, can fit into history, in the history of the church at this moment in time. And hopefully I've given you some actionable steps. Really appreciate your time. I encourage you to go find your why. And thank you so much. How do you buy the cards? So, um, just talk to me. Just come up and talk to me. <laughs> we'll do business. We'll do a couple like, uh, questions. We'll do a couple questions. All right. <laughs> <laughs> wow, people like these cards. Hey, uh, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Can you tell me about why you always wear the same clothes? Oh, sure. Yeah, why I always wear the same clothes. So, um, one of my beliefs is that um, you shouldn't complicate your life. So try to strip out things in your life, and that uh, is uh, lived out in my uh, my attire. So yeah, it's pretty simple. <laughs> um, I, I mean, there's a couple. You know, I could kind of go more philosophical, but um, so yeah, that, that's it really. It's it's pretty simple. Uh, we all wear pretty much the same thing every day. So why don't I just take it one step further and wear literally the same thing every day? <laughs> so, so I obviously work at a church. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So you, you talk about the, the mantra being something completely different than what you do. And I think certainly for companies, I think that, that's a great idea. Um, I'm just trying to figure out like how a parish could have a, could have a mantra that didn't have Jesus in it. Oh, right, right, right. So what's interesting is that the, the catechism is that these are like, these are beliefs, right? And they're not necessarily actionable, right? Um, what I would say is that um, what, you, what we have, what's beautiful about the Catholic Church is that we have a core set of unwavering beliefs, but in each of these, uh, these things that undergird our beliefs are individualism, is our individualism, right? So what you could potentially do very practically is go to your stakeholders, the sponsors, whatever the heck you want to call them, the people making decisions, and you can, I mean, you could even distill it down to individual parishioners or some sort of uh, campaign in which you get kind of this ethos from your parish. And what's beautiful about your parish is that there is something incredibly unique 
that you believe and that you can individually tackle. So I don't know what that would be, but we could do a belief session <laughs> and I can help you to find what that is. Um, it's amazing what emerges from these things and how different we really all are. In my uh, talk summary before, it's on the website, uh, is the quote from C.S. Lewis, how, how um, something along the lines of, the tyrants are all the same, but how beautifully different are all the saints. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but it does. Thank you, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I do a lot of branding for companies, and, some, and especially small businesses. Um, so, a lot of the times, uh, my clients have a hard time distinguishing their personal core beliefs and their company's core beliefs. And how do you usually recommend like, is there a blending of them, or do you usually direct people to creating a whole separate set of beliefs and branding for, you know, a company, and how, like, how, where's the intersection of, you know, a, a business owner's belief and the company's beliefs? Hmm. So, maybe you can clarify one thing for me. Are you saying that individuals that work at the company believe different things, or are you saying yeah, that... Yeah, like, the, you know, the business, I have, like, business owner's company, and they want to, like, project their own Onto their business, and they, they have a hard time separating themselves from their business, and not knowing if there should be a separation, or if there should be more like an intersection between their personal brand and their business brand. Mm. Yeah. So the, I think the beauty of this idea of why is that you can have both. So there's no dichotomy there. So in terms of the idea of starting with why and, and, and utilizing that concept in your business so that it does all those things that I had written down. It differentiates you, it, it helps you through hard times, it helps with your marketing copy, is that those things um, uh, are usually initiated by founders or the, the heads of the company, right? And the beauty of it, like I had said, is that it lives or it is persistent throughout time. So you can either evolve them you can completely change them. They can be somehow tertiary or related to what you originally believed, or you can um, you can you can that those can live throughout the entire length of the company. So, in terms of individuals believing things that are in conflict with their companies, I think that would be the only that would be the only time that I would say you you really need to actually think about your why in, in yeah. that sense. Like, like yeah, I was thinking like how much of Steve Jobs is it happening? Oh like yeah yeah. I would say probably on 90%. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, that's just, that's the way the dynamic of that company was. Yeah. Now, if a CEO believes something completely different than what his company believes, the, the strange thing is that most companies don't know why, right? I, I hope that this concept is somewhat fresh and new to you, or it somehow gets you thinking, because this is, in my experience, a lot of companies don't know why they do what they do. And so, the, the, the way that it, that plays out, I think, in a very negative way, is some, a company like Yahoo. They just hemorrhage CEOs, because no one knows why they're doing what they're doing. There's no core mission. Sorry, there's no core beliefs. Again, it's not mission, it's not what you do, it's why you, why you do it. So, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, sure. oh. um, what about for, you know, I work for a company that's 20 years old, and they've gone through a lot of changes, but hitting this point where they have to have to come down and yeah. say how are we going to differentiate ourselves yeah. and it's so hard for them to let go of everything they've been through and to commit to saying one thing um, what do you find are ways to get over that I guess fear of limiting you might feel like you're limiting yourself mm. I guess I would ask, why are they wanting to differentiate are they wanting to pivot or are they simply wanting to find their why I think it's fine to find the why so, okay. so they can pivot so they can so they can pivot. So they're finding problems with sales or something like that, right? Okay. So the reason why they're probably finding problems with sales is the same reason why the company I was at originally had found had problems um, to begin with. That tension I was talking about is because no one knew why, right? I think I had kind of glossed over that part of the story, but when I had come back, when I had listened to this podcast, I came back to the company and we did an entire belief session. And it completely changed the way that stakeholders looked at the company. And it really re-energized everyone. Now, the company ultimately, I won't get into why it didn't work out, um, for me. It's actually still going and it's, it's great. Um, but the, uh, the way I would answer your question is that yes, they can simply take their experiences 
it's essentially their personal experiences collectively agreed on as a, as a system of beliefs, like those five that I did for Foyer, and um, that was the agency, and yeah, it's, it's, it's that. And that will help them to understand why are we pivoting in the first place, right? It really informs every decision it should, at least. So hopefully that helps. We'll take one more. Uh, okay. uh, 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 Matt, come on, do it! Right. Um, you said that uh, your design system with your visual language should flow from your manifesto. Is there a practical way that you can tell us to you know, kind of build that design system and that visual language out of something like a Catholic company's manifesto of, of you know, like we believe in, in the Catholic faith and the true community of the Catholic faith? Yeah. Yeah, I think I will individually come down to the way that you interpret your beliefs. Right, um, and the way that you see it panning out, there are so many different ways uh, that design can be exemplified or like visualized. Right, design is there's so many different ways of describing what design is, but there's two I really like. It, design is the rational organization of information. Right, and so if you can rationalize in any cohesive way why this button should look that way, or why the form should read this way, or why the website does this or why our print materials fold this certain way. That might be getting a little too nitty gritty with folding, but you'll, I hope you're understanding the concept, or I hope I'm conveying the concept of that this concept of why bleeds into everything. And if you, if you can rash, if you can, sorry, not rationalize, but if you can justify your decisions based on beliefs, then it becomes cohesive. It's not arbitrary. And it becomes something that's true to you. It's not just some bye bye bye, right? Like that said, so. Could you give an example of like a design where you found a core belief and then actually designed around that? Like any specific thing? Yeah, sure. So this one, um, I don't have the logo here, but this design system, uh, the company is called Foyer, and their mark, they have no mark, obviously, to begin with. Their mark is based on the concept of foyer, but the mark is more based on the concept of inviting someone into your space um, so that you can learn together. And so that's just one practical application. Brand marks and like actual, but people when they think of branding, they think of logos, typography, and colors, right? The thing about branding is that it's really the why. That's what branding really is. So hopefully I've conveyed that with the title of my talk, Beliefs in Branding. Um, so that would be one really practical application. Learn from the past, expect the future. Uh, let's think about this one, don't think of black or white. That's pretty simple, their whole website's black and white, and they have this one little pop of red throughout the whole website. So this concept of don't think of black and white justified and informed the decision of making everything black and white. So that's at least one. Um, I could probably think of a million more, but um, yeah, starting with why informs everything. Wesley! <laughs>